again. Uh, I'm Abdurrahman Hussein, and um, it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker, Derek Clark. He is a project manager at the district, and we, he will be discussing how we can use fluvial hazard zones as a tool for our flood risk management. Please help me introduce. Please help, please help me welcome Derek to the stage. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction. And honestly, thank you to everyone out here for hanging in there as we get to these kind of last final presentations. I'd like to think everyone's really excited to hear more about fluvial hazard zones, but I fully realize that I'm being followed by Dave Scudis and his world famous curtain call presentations. And I tend to agree, it's can't miss entertainment. So I'll try to make this in a timely fashion, but I do want to speak a little bit to fluvial hazard zones and some of the applications we've had within the Sand Creek watershed. So first, just a little bit of history. The fluvial hazard zone proto mapping protocol was developed uh, with the Colorado Water Conservation Board in partnership with several outside consultants, which we'll give uh, credit to later in this slide. And it was really the impetus behind this was after the 2013 flood event. A little fun fact for your next trivia night is that 52% of the flood claims that happened in the 2013 event happened outside of the regulatory floodplain. And so there was really a recognition that we needed a further hazard mapping to help understand some of the risks that we have in these fluvial systems. And I love this quote that was included in that uh, manual. It's very important to understand that this is not introducing new hazards to your community. This is simply helping to define those hazards that are already there. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to really dive deep into how these different components are developed, but I do think it's important to have a basic understanding about what they mean. First, and probably most importantly, is your active stream corridor. You can think of this as your modern geomorphic floodplain. We would expect to see some horizontal and vertical migration here. We'd expect to see erosion and deposition, and we'd expect to see some movement out on the floodplain terraces. Moving out from that, you have the fluvial hazard buffer. This is erosion prone hill slopes and terraces that are at a high risk of a hill slope failure if there is scour at the toe of that slope. The geotechnical flag takes that a step further. These are hill slopes that either due to their height, their steepness, or even the materials that comprise that hill slope at are, are at a high risk of a failure that could extend even outside of the limits of the fluvial hazard zone. And the last one I wanna to touch on is the fan or the alluvial fan, which you might have some familiarity with. This is essentially where a steep, confined reach hits a wide open and flat area, and we expect to see some, some deposition of sediment in those areas. So let's take you to Sand Creek. Here's a couple of the studies that we, we did in Sand Creek. Uh, we've done Sand Creek and Coal Creek and Murphy Creek, essentially from Colfax Avenue all the way up to Yale. For a little bit of a geographic location here, the Dad's Landfill, which is very visually appealing, um, is just south of this picture. Now, this is an area that has a lot of active development here, and being sand bed systems is a very dynamic system. And so really there was a huge need to have a study and better understand these areas. Next, I just wanna jump into a few high-level applications before jumping into some project-specific applications that we've used these studies for. First, these can be a great tool in the planning process. It can help understand those informed development decisions. One of the most cost-effective solutions to those risks is to try to mitigate and reduce your risk against that, not try to just design against that risk. This is particularly important where you have that human element around there. We found that these maps can be a very effective tool at conveying this information to the general public. They're already kind of on board with seeing floodplain delineations and understand what that means. And so seeing a fluvial hazard line on their house is another way of saying, hey, there may be a huge risk here. I just wanted to note that there is also, a, although small, there is a potential CRS credit that municipalities can get for including these other hazard mapping protocols as part of their planning process. And when we're talking about infrastructure, I don't want you just to think houses and structures, I want you also to think about utilities and roadways. This great picture from Estes Parks demonstrates that. And these zoning maps can be a great way of identifying this at-risk infrastructure as well as planning for future infrastructure. 
One of my favorites is on the conservation and preservation side. Here's a great picture near the Aurora Sports Park of an outfall going to Coal Creek. Just a delightful picture. These maps can be a great way to identify land that has a conservation benefit, particularly those lands where you have surrounding development and you have that human element involved. By giving the stream the room that it needs to move, you also remove that risk to that human element while also allowing these kind of more detailed processes to happen around the stream. These detailed processes honestly create awesome and very diverse habitats that can support all kinds of aquatic and terrestrial life forms. This is a great graphic. This really shows you how far we've already come on these steps. This highlights the conservation easements and green spaces that we have along the active stream corridors of these studies. Truly remarkable. We have the Triple Creek Greenway, which is some conservation easements in partnership with the city of Aurora and Arapahoe County. County. And for your more serious recreational users like me, you have your Murphy Creek Golf Course, your Spring Hill Golf Course, and of course the Aurora Sports Park. Now what might jump out at you is that there's a few empty spaces missing in between these green spaces. And these are areas of heavy active development currently going on. These are opportunities that we have to identify ways that we can extend these green spaces and make them an amenity to these developments. Finally, I just want to touch on a few specific risk identifications that we had through these studies and just some applications that we took from them. First, I'd like to talk about the avulsion hazard at Murphy Creek at Piccadilly Road. If you're unfamiliar with what an avulsion hazard is, it's when a channel actually leaves its existing channel banks and forms an entirely new channel along a new alignment. Let's take you to the area of Murphy Creek. As you can see, we're at the downstream side of Murphy Creek right before the confluence with Coal Creek. A lot of upstream development has increased storm event flows in this area as well as flow volume. Unfortunately, there's undersized existing infrastructure in this area, which not only has trouble passing the flows that are in this area, but also has trouble passing any sediment that's being moved along this channel. Due to the low air lying area to the north, this, this area was uh, identified as being ripe for an avulsion hazard, where Murphy Creek would actually carve a new path and try to reconnect into Coal Creek on the east side of Piccadilly Road. Well, if you remember last year in May, we had a very heavy storm events in the city of Aurora, particularly the Murphy Creek and the Tollgate drainage basins. And that's just what we saw happen. In a high flow event, portions of this flow split out and traveled almost 1,600 feet to the north, finding another low-lying area of Piccadilly Road before overtopping and cutting an entirely new channel into the gravel ponds to the east. You can see a little bit of the housing infrastructure just to the south of where this path went. This really helps drive home that these hazards are something that we should be identifying, especially when there's development in those areas. Here's a great comparison versus the years. You can see in April of last year, you had basically flat ground happening there. And just a few short months later, it overtopped that roadway, carved a new channel, and you can see the sediment plume in the gravel ponds. Just for a little better idea of scale, here's a picture of that channel avulsion uh, standing on Piccadilly Road. Next, I wanna take you to a geotechnical flag that was identified on the downstream side of Jewel Avenue. Much like other presenters today, I also made the mistake of showing this to my nine-year-old daughter. I was really trying to get her, impact, her input on this. So I said, what do you see in this picture? And she says, Dad, that channel looks sick. And I was like, wow, I was really taken back by that. I was like, I couldn't believe that she equated this with health. And I was like, you're right, honey. It, it does look unwell in this area. And she goes, no, Dad, I meant it looked cool. <laughs> but my idea here is that it really doesn't take a geomorphologist to see that something's going on on this outside bend. And what a fluvial hazard zone study can do is identify these risks, and, and it really doesn't give the answer right away, but it just identifies that we need more information in that area. So that's exactly what the project team did. There's a developable parcel just at the top of this slope. The project team got out there and wanted to actually get eyes on this feature. And what they found out was that the toe of the slope was actually relatively stable. 
there was a lot of good wetland vegetation there, and that a lot of the gully erosion that you're seeing here was coming from runoff at the top of the slope. Knowing this information, they were able to work with the developer to get their future impervious runoff routed away from these areas and not further exacerbate the gully erosion that we see here. Also, they were able to use the advice of a geotechnical engineer to try to understand what a hill slope failure would look like in this area and try to establish some kind of buffer to keep development out of that area. Another thing might catch your eye in this graphic, but there's a little patch of disturbed ground to the southwest of this channel. This was a wastewater inter interceptor that was recently put in there. And although it is likely within the, the zones of this fluvial hazard zone, I know I feel a lot better about it being on that side of the channel as opposed to the other. The last spot I want to take you to is Yamaha Creek at the confluence with Coal Creek, where an alluvial fan was identified. I think a topographic map is the best way to see this. What you see in the upstream portions of Yamaha Creek is a more confined channel. And as it works its way down to Coal Creek, it hits a very wide and very flat floodplain terrace of Coal Creek. Hence the need for an alluvial fan designation in that area. Yamaha Creek has about 960 acres of tributary upstream of this that's completely undeveloped in the present time. With the sandy soils, this is a great spot that you see a lot of infiltration. And those smaller storm events, you really don't see a lot of concentrated flow in Yamaha Creek. But what happens as development starts to come online? And we see more frequent flow events from those smaller storm events, as well as larger flow volumes. For a little bit of context, here's a little bit of what the upstream reach looks like. Yes, you have a relatively wide, flat bottom on that. It is somewhat contained. And there is evidence that there hasn't really been a low flow channel carved through there yet, which kind of supports the idea of <clears throat> that there hasn't really been a lot of concentrated flow to this date. As you move out to, towards the alluvial fan, you see it becomes a wide, flat area with no real designated flow path. And it has to carve about 750 feet before it actually hits the invert of, of Coal Creek. So just knowing this information, we're able to make more in, informed decisions with development. In this particular case, we're working with the developer to come up with a solution um, for improvements that we could do to Yamaha Creek that would help convey some of the sediment through the system, but not necessarily disrupt any sediment that's been deposited within that alluvial fan. Since this is in the conservation easement, our concern really isn't about development. It's about upsetting the sediment that is in that alluvial fan and causing problems downstream of this. And I just want to take a quick minute just to go through some additional applications that we didn't necessarily use in these two particular studies, but these are very valuable tools that fluvial hazard studies can be used for. One is for uh, wildfire planning and preparation. And as we all know, rainfall over a burn scar can not only produce a lot of sediment, sediment but it can also cause widespread flooding. These maps can be developed relatively quickly, and as I mentioned, they're very easily digestible by the public and so that they can make more informed decisions when it comes to their own personal safety. Along those same lines, just general emergency planning. It's a great way to identify at-risk critical facilities, such as hospitals and schools, as well as maybe not thought about, but evacuation route planning. It's probably not smart to have a bunch of people going through an area of a roadway that may be in an active stream corridor. Just something to think about. And for me personally, I, on my private consultant side, I've done some dam breach analysis. I've done these, uh, these models, and they're very large flow events, but it's over a static topography. It's really just looking at those inundation limits. But as we know, with flood events that large, you're going to see a lot of erosion and a lot of deposition. And a lot of times, you're going to have catastrophic damages that happen outside of that high water mark. I just want to take this time to really give thanks to Katie Yacht, Michael Blazewicz, uh, Joel Schultz, um, and their teams. They uh, put a lot of work into developing that, that mapping protocol, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> as well as doing the Sand Creek Fluvial Hazard Study. I also want to thank Bill Spitz and the Olson team for their work on the Murphy Creek Fluvial Hazard Study. And also want to thank my predecessor in the Sand Creek Watershed, Morgan Lynch, because she was a real spearhead for bringing these studies to the district. And honestly, she saw the value, and now I can see why.